Good morning, thank you for joining us. Today we're going to discuss how to harvest honey from your flow hive. Now it's a common question, people have got their flow hive and they just want to know how to do it and refresh themselves. So we're going to run over that this morning and look at these bees go. They're here on this beautiful day flying in and out of their hive and doing their amazing thing producing their honey. Isn't it a, a magical thing to be able to watch your bees produce the honey from your surrounding area and bring it back into your hive. So one of the first things we're going to do is have a look not only in the side windows for, for the capped honey but also in the end windows. So let's just take a look at the hive first and get a little bit of a feel for what's going on inside. So if you see here we've got uh, a whole bunch of frames and this cross-sectional view of the bees filling the cells with honey. Now you can see here this checker pattern when it's full then empty, full then empty, they're actually there's a little bit of a lull in the nectar flow so we're, they're experiencing a bit less honey coming in now and they're starting to retract it away from the ends. So that can happen. Now if we were to choose a frame or choose a nice full one like this one where you can see that most of the cells are full or, or this one here and if I even look in I can see that the capping is right on the frames. So that's the wax cap the bees put right over the top of the cell when it's ready. Now because I'm seeing a bit of honey that's being eaten away I'm going to look in the side windows as well just to check that there's, that there's plenty of honey in the hive. Now, I can see glistening white capping beneath their feet. So this hive is actually quite full. We did harvest one of the frames last week which they're, they're busy filling back up again. So without further ado, I'll show you how to set up your jar shelf. So there's these little brackets. The best way to put them on is facing up like that. Keyhole goes over the screw depending on what height you want to set. And then you twist it into position. Now if it's a bit loose, adjust that screw. If it's a bit uh, tight and you can't turn it around into position, then you'll need to loosen it off. Once you've got it set, it should stay good for next time. The other side as well, we're just putting the shelf bracket on. The actual cover that came from here goes right on there. And that's a common question we get, where is my shelf? Well, we've double used the window cover for a shelf right here. That works quite nicely. You can put your jar on there like that. We're going to take out some of these little caps. So I'm going to choose this frame here because it looks nice and full. I'm going to use this little tag here to lever this out. You can use your fingers too, but just in case it's a bit tight. It's a handy little, little tool to get that out. Okay, next I'm going to insert that tube with the little tongue right into the bottom here. There we go. It's important, logos up, tongues cleaning out that little point there. I'll explain that more later. So we've got our jar underneath, we are ready to roll. So that's how easy it is to get yourself set up. And it's a case of just getting your key, putting it in, just go in a little way at first and then turn it to a 90. And what that does is move the insides of our flow frame parts from this shape to this shape, allowing honey to drain down into the trough at the bottom and out. If you want to harvest a little bit, you can just go ahead and insert the key a little way and you will get a, a small amount of honey from the end of the frame, just a jar or so. You can see that honey coming down already, which is a beautiful thing. I'm going to go ahead and put that key back to a 90 again, like this. Go in and turn again. That just makes it easier to turn. So I've got about half the frame harvesting now. Some people like to stage it because you can get into a situation where there's so much honey coming out that uh, the trough gets so full that you might get some spills inside the hive. So some people will stage that. I'm going to go ahead and just put the key all the way in now and turn it and the honey should flow out. We missed a couple of steps in the beginning and that was just to check you're on the right angle. So while that honey's starting to flow, isn't it a beautiful thing? Pouring out like that. Then we just want to make sure we are on the right level. Good thing to do before you start in the flow hive 2 and 2 plus we've got a level bubble in the side. You just want it 
squarely in the middle and that gets your perfect three degree backward slope harvesting angle. There's another one in the back here that we use mainly for drawing natural comb but nice if that's in the middle as well. Away you go, honey pouring out. It's a, uh, a here in the southern hemisphere because it brings all of these lighter coloured honeys that are often quite floral and there's so many different flavours from around the area and you'll get different flavours from different frames which is one of the joys of a flow hive so I would recommend just harvesting straight into a jar. Some people put all of the frames into a bucket but then you're mixing what could be a really enjoyable experience of tasting the different flavours all into one flavour. Still good honey but to me, not quite as good as being able to isolate those flavours and with your friends. Any questions, please put them in the comments below and we'll get to answering those. The honey's pouring out and it's looking beautiful. There is no more further processing that is needed. The honey is ready for the table. It rarely has anything and if it does, little flecks of wax might just float to the top. But you can see that there, it's just perfect. There's no more processing needed. Only gravity is used to get it out of the hive. It hasn't been in your human hands. It's just ready to go. Any questions, Great. Yeah, Trace? Yeah, um, everyone loving it. Um, watching that honey coming out. We've got Peter Cox, our flow ambassador, who's joined us from South Australia as well. You know, Peter. Uh, which is great. Um, look, Shannon's asking, and Cedar just noticed that you've harvested the honey and you looked at the back of the hive and it was full. Do you need to actually go in and check that the whole super is capped or? You can if you want to, but the way it works is if you start noticing what's going on in your frames here and in the side windows, you'll get an idea of how full the hive is. Now, commercial beekeepers usually will harvest honey if it's 70% capped. So using this, I find it's a pretty good gauge and it's only on the very rare occasion that you might harvest some honey that is a bit too liquid with the moisture content down below that 20% range. So the danger is you could harvest honey too early before they've capped it in some frames. Now, at worst, that honey will have a moisture content that's too low and it might ferment more easily. And you might need to keep it in the fridge or consume that or make some mead with it. Uh, so if, if you notice that it's very liquid, when this honey cools down, it should look like honey. It's a bit warm now because it's come straight out of the hive, so you can see it's moving a bit more liquid than honey usually moves. But as it cools, it should look like honey does with that moisture content down around the 18% range. If you're concerned about that, you can get a refractometer to test your honey and make sure it's going to keep in the jars on the shelf. So as you say, you can get in there and inspect the frames, but to me it's not needed each time you harvest and the idea is you build up your knowledge from looking at the observations of what's going on and know when it's time to harvest. Great, uh, I've seen a tizzer who always tunes in um, when we're doing Facebook lives, caught a couple of swarms this season and needs to move them into the garden. Could they move them a few feet without upsetting them? Okay, great question. Well done catching a couple of swarms this time in the southern hemisphere. We've, we've um, got swarm season that's kind of passed in our area already. It usually happens quite early. So yes, you can move them. Now I'll just run through when you first catch a swarm, there's an opportune moment to move them straight away. Uh, but if you haven't done that, as you say, you can move them a, a short way. And there's a couple of, of, or a long way, there's a couple of, um, ways you can do that or run through them. One is you can just pick up your hive, get in your bee suit of course, get another person, lift up the hive and just move it say one to two meters. About this far would be your maximum distance you'd want to move it at a time and you can slowly hop it across your yard. Now you can do that probably twice a day and the bees will then follow that hive. If you wanted to move it say 100 meters away in one go then, or, or anywhere from 100 metres to say four kilometres, then 
You could use a distraction technique. Now bees geolocate to the spot. They're so clever using their landmarks and things that they know exactly which hive is theirs. And what you'll need to do, otherwise if you just pick it up and move it a short way, you'll find there'll be a whole lot of bees that'll go back to the old location. But you can use a distraction technique to help them reorientate to the new position. And you can do that just by when you move, move them, the best thing to do would be to get up really early in the morning and close up your hive before they're out, or you could do it the night before. Making sure they've got adequate ventilation when you do that. Take the tray out, give them plenty of, of uh, ventilation up through the screen bottom board. Then uh, that night or in the morning, you can move it to the, the position and put in front of the hive some either a whole lot of foliage, you could snap some branches off some, some things and put them in front, or you could get a, a rag like an old t-shirt or something and tape it right in front of the hive and just leave them a little, little ways to get out. And the uh, bees will come flying out, run into those obstacles and go, hang on, something's different, something's changed. And most of the bees will then reorientate to that new location. It's a handy trick when you want to move a short way you still get 5% or so of the foragers returning to the old location. You can either let them find another hive if there's one back at the old spot, or you can put a, a, some kind of box there to collect them and then ferry them to the new location. Another way to do it if you, is to move the hive a long way. So same thing, you're blocking it up in the early morning. Moving it, say, uh, more than four miles or six kilometres, and then what you can do is leave it there for a month or so until those foragers have forgotten the landmarks. Basically what happens is the turnover of bees means there's new bees in a month or so that are doing your foraging and they don't know the old location. So then when you shift it back again, it's a fresh new location for those new foragers. So there's a few ways to move your hive complicated answers like most things in beekeeping. <laughs> Cedar, um, do you think it's too late to start a hive in Mildura, Victor which is in northwest Victoria, which is south of us here in Australia? Uh, no, it's, it's um, still springtime here and you could probably start a hive, uh, I mean always ask local beekeepers knowledge and the best time to start a hive is probably when you can get hold of bees. So ask around to see who's got bees, but this time of year, all over Australia, is a pretty good time to get started in beekeeping. And you could, you could keep starting your hives all the way through summer, and depending on how you start, you could even start in the autumn and also your location. So it's a perfect time of year to get started. Fantastic. Cedar, when you're harvesting like you're doing now, is it best to do one or can you do them all at the same time if they're full? So what I find, it's best to checker it. So, so do one, then skip one, then harvest one, then skip one. So you might harvest, say, three or four of these frames at once. And that makes it a bit more efficient for the bees, a bit less disruptive for the bees, and they can use the remaining bit because there'll be five percent or more of honey left in the frame when we finally turn the key and they can use that to replenish any uh, cells in the neighbouring frames to keep them topped up so it's a bit more efficient to do it that way but you can go ahead and harvest all your frames also just bear in mind harvest a few first check you're not getting big honey spills check your setups right before you go ahead and harvest all of them at once. So you know, once you've harvested, John's asking, do you need to go in and remove the caps so the bees will refill them? On. So you don't, it was a bit of a wild card. So it was a long journey, a decade of inventing the flow hive with my father. And we had all sorts of contraptions in there using like uh, different surfaces, silicons and all sorts of things, thinking we'd have to have a, a, a member with the capping on it that moves away in order to harvest because it is hard to get honey out of hexagon cells when the capping's on them. And um, so we thought you'd have to move that away and then somehow um, disrupt it so the bees can then start again. But 
Lucky for us, the bees are so clever, they notice when the honey's drained out from beneath their feet. So I imagine it's like the bees walking on a drum skin. It, it no longer feels and sounds like it did when it was full of honey. And they're quick to start investigating and chewing away that capping, coating the cells in wax, joining all of the partly formed cells together, and away they go again. You'll notice if you harvest a side window, we're not harvesting the side one today, that you'll see them even carrying around flecks of wax moments after your, your harvesting. And they're already starting the process of tearing the capping off and rebuilding those cells. Cedar, I have a question about different flavours of honey in different frames. And that's that, is it possible to know if the same groups of bees work on the same frames? So the way it works with bees is one forager bee collects a very small amount of honey in its lifetime, probably only a quarter of a teaspoon to add to the hive. But there's up to 50,000 of them in a hive, so it all adds up to incredible amounts of beautiful honey. So that one forager bee will probably only go to one type of flower in its life unless the nectar runs out. So the way it works is if there's a, um, a big flowering, that those bees that are going to find that flowering after they've got the information from the dance in the hive will continue till that nectar source is exhausted. And if those bees uh, are coming back, what they actually do is then regurgitate the honey from the honey stomach to another bee who then places it in the cell. So you can't necessarily know whether the bees are going to do what's a monofloral source and fill that, that frame completely with that one type of honey. But what you usually get is the bees start from the centre of the hive and move towards the extremities when they're filling. So that means if they were filling up these two first when the ironbark was flowering in the springtime, these might end up ironbark. And then perhaps another flower comes on and you get a, another type of flower source which colours the honey, which changes the taste in the, the next ones out. And then the, the uh, wild quince might flower and the really light floral bursts and then you might get the melaleuca flowering which um, comes in kind of fluoro yellow but then turns a chocolate brown in, in the end. So you've, you've got all of these different flavours that that you'll find in the different frames simply because of the timing of when they're filling and that the bees will tend to go to one nectar source until that nectar source has run out. Great question. Great question. Thanks, Cedar. Sam's asking, um, can they put a flow hive on top of a regular hive? You can. So that's called uh, Flow Super, is just this bit. We call it Flow. That's our brand. That's our invention. These are our flow frames and you can simply get this box and put it on top of a regular hive and we've sized it so it fits uh, most sizes good enough. Here we go, we're getting a really good harvest this morning. These are 300 mil jars and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven so far uh, jars of honey. Fantastic. So we're almost up to two litres from this frame already. Cedar, when, um, because of the, the slope on the flow hive, does it mean that when they've got, if they're putting on a regular, do they need to add a slope in or does it come with the super? That's a uh, good question. Thanks for, for, for drilling in further. The, um, when you add a super to a normal hive, typically beekeepers will tend to run a standard Langstroth hive sloping the other way so water doesn't go in the entrance. Now what that means for you is you can either keep it that way and you'll need to change the slope when it's time to harvest, which is a bit annoying. You've got to lift the front up and get it all prepared. Um, but, and also it messes up this little process called the leak back point in here where you can see this little gap. Now that's there that so sometimes the bees will uh, depending on how they join the parts of the frames together, you get a bit of dripping of honey into that area. Now it can fill up over time. If it's sloping forward, it can't return into the hive through that little slot. And when you rock it back, you might suddenly get a bunch of honey that's been up the other end of a while. You didn't know it was there and it could be fermented. 
so that's um, that's one thing I would recommend sloping it backwards towards the harvesting alternatively you could run the box the other way around but then you're harvesting right in front of the entrance which isn't going to be nearly as nice experience there's going to be bees everywhere getting in the honey and getting on you and so on so harvesting at the other side from the rent entrance is better and maintaining a per permanent slope is better because you don't have to do it before you go and this leak back works nicely but you'll need to control the water now we've got a screen bottom board so any water can go right through that and not stay inside the hive where the bees are and we've also sloped the landing board away so the bulk of the water goes out so there's some considerations there in deciding how to set it up i'd recommend you uh you work out how you can set it up with permanent three degree slope backwards if you're using a flow super on a regular langstroth hive Great. Amazing, Sandy. We've got people tuning in this morning from Nepal and Norway. Ah, I love that. Nepal, rhododendron honey. I did some great paragliding up that way, uh, flying tandem with my other half long before we had our kids. And um, a yeah, spectacular area with all those rhododendrons. You must get some, some nice honey up there. Oh, fantastic. And now um, our, our listener in from Norway is wondering, it gets really cold there. Is it too cold to have a flow hive? It's not, you know, there's this um, kind of myth that, oh, yeah, flow hives won't work in colder regions. It started from the very beginning before anyone had even tried. And you still get that um, mainly from Europe, this kind of notion that no, it won't work, but it's not true. We've got lots of people in Europe with flow hives enjoying harvesting. Jamie Oliver recently putting lots of great videos out of harvesting and people right up as far as Norway and also right up into Canada as well. So there's lots of people harvesting flow hives in colder regions as well. When it's time to harvest, it's usually the warmer time anyway. So. So it, it still flows out quite nicely. If it is colder, it'll just flow a bit slower. Here we are. It's been, what, um, almost half an hour and we've just about completed this harvest. It could take an hour or longer if it is colder when you're harvesting. Great, Melissa's asking, and this is a question we get quite a bit through customer support, is when um, she's setting the flow hive with the flow frames, they don't, when she's got them in the clothes, they don't look like they're completely that they meet or they join. Is this how they're supposed to be? Or is, she's just wondering, and it's a question we get asked quite a lot as well. Very nice observations there. So the reason why the parts don't meet together is for the bee's knees. And basically, out of a decade of testing, we wanted to, of course, make it uh, um, not harm bees. And when, we found when the parts were meeting like that, um, you could harvest fine, but if there was bees down the cells, let's say if you hadn't waited to, till it's capped or there was an area that didn't have capping and the bees were down there, then the bees would, would um, be down there when you did that. And potentially when you closed it again, they could poke a leg or a wing through that area and get stuck. So what we did is that we put a, a V shape. So what you see down the cell lines is a V shape like this and the bees bridge that with their wax. So when it opens and closes, you've still got that V left and they can't get a leg or a wing caught in that area. At worst, they could get stuck in a bit of wax that was in that area and they could then slowly move out and the other bees could help them also. So that's why you see them with the, the gaps between the parts. Now there's another uh, alignment, not only that way, but also this way. So if you find that there's a whole lot of cells sitting up like that, what you need to do is put the key in the top slot and turn it. And that's part of the setup process. I might even show you how to do that now, even though there's still some nice honey coming out and we could still probably get another jar or more, I might go ahead and show you how to close the frame. So here's the key. When you set it up for the first time, do make sure you put it in the top slot. So you've just installed your flow frames. You, you're uh, just about to put the, them onto your hive. The key goes in the top like that. Then you turn it to a 90. And what that does is push all of the cells back into cell formed position. That's also the process when you finish harvesting. Don't forget to do that. 
we've tried to make a reminder with this little tag that if you forget, it's hard to put the cap in because there's a little tag there. A tip when harvesting is when you're finished harvesting, leave it in that downways position, putting some pressure on them to move all of those parts back in to position and leave it there for a minute or so just to make sure all those parts get back in line. If you imagine wax and propolis and things, it's slow moving stuff and there'll be a bit of resistance. If you just do a quick close and move on, you'll find you'll get a bounce back of the parts. And then you end up with cells that aren't quite in line and that creates problems downstream of wax build up in these little areas here, creating spills and so on. So I've really noticed, make sure you turn the key in the top slot when you're finished harvesting and leave it there for a minute before taking that key out. Great, so you've got any tips and tricks. Jay's um, had flow high for just, just around a year now. Um, they've been, they haven't really had much happening in the super. He's done the wax thing, or painted the wax thing on it. Got any tips or tricks to try and encourage them up there? Okay. The best recipe for getting bees to get started the first time on the flow frames is lots of bees in your hive and a good nectar flow. And those two things need to align. If you find when you open the window there's just really hardly any bees or no bees at all, then you could have a bit of an issue with your hive in terms of not building up the numbers or perhaps just you didn't have quite enough flowers for a long time. So you need flowers for a, for a while with nectar in order to get them going, in order to get them building. But if you find other hives are really bringing in the honey and that one's not, then I would recommend um, changing the queen to some more virile genetics where she can, she can do a lot, of, a lot more laying of eggs and get, it all, all, uh, get your hive pumping with lots and lots of bees that can go and get the flowers. So that's, um, that's what I'd recommend doing. Rather than painting wax, an easier thing to do if you do want to experiment a little bit is scrape some burr comb off from your brood nest and just using your hive tool mash it into the flow frame surface on the inside, not on the outside of the glass. And then you can watch the process of then redistributing that wax and recycling it and that can be a way to speed up things a little bit. But as I said, you really just need lots of bees in your hive and a good nectar flow and they'll get straight into it. Great, so the Chuck's um, had his flow frames for about four years. Oh, oh nearly fell off the seat then. Um, <laughs> Cedar, how long will they last for? Okay, so it's, uh, it, it's new technology to the world, I guess, and we're hoping they'll last for a very long time. And if you do have any trouble with your flow frames, get in contact. It's, it's, uh, we want them to be a very long lasting product and we'll look after you. So basically um, we've, we've still got uh, frames at home that are, that are now, we've been going for six years and now around before launch, so a long time now. But I guess we're still in the early stages of this invention being in the world so thank you for being one of the early adopters and helping uh, get our technology and our invention to the world. Right, Cedar so um, Brian is asking how do you close up the hive when you're wanting to move it? Okay so there's a few ways to do that. Uh, one is to use an entrance reducer. Jai could you go and get one off the, one of the hives, there's one over there and I'll just show you what that looks like. And we have that entrance reducer and entrance closure that you can put right on the front of your hive and I might even be able to show you how to do that right now. It's basically just a piece to close it. Now you could use a piece of wood or you could use uh, steel wool, it's probably one of the easiest ways if you get steel wool. Um, now I'm just realising that this isn't the right size for this hive, this is the six frame flow hive size and we need the seven. So it's, an it's, a, it's an example of it but basically um, here's the, the two different sizes. You'll see one's a little bit longer than the other and the way it works is one way up is an entrance reducer to, to limit the entrance and that's a useful thing to do in those areas where you need to reduce the entrance down and give your bees a bit of protection from robbing things like bees, other bees and wasps and so on. 
And the other one is uh, the um, mice as well. Now it's said that the most common mice in North America doesn't get into the flow hive anyway because it's got a thinner entrance, but let us know how you go and whether this helps. Spinning it up this way, it becomes a closure with, with ventilation. So you can see that there, the little holes running through. And once you put your wing screws in the front, all our new hives come out with marks on them. You can just close the entrance. So you can see, huh, this hive doesn't have it. Let's have a look at the next hive along. So there's a, a hive just over here where you can see these L screws. It's a case of just choosing a, a moment like this early in the morning and you can then close it over and turn that L screw and that'll hold it in place. So I won't do it now because I don't really want to close up the hive. Now that will only work if you have your boxes in line. If, there's, if they're too much out of line then there'll be a gap for the bees to get out. So a little bit of caveat there, the best way to straighten them up is one of those woodworking clamps. You can put it on here and just clamp it up and the box will pull into line if you need to get the alignment right. Now, another way is just steel wool. It's nice and malleable. Not the dish scrubber type, but the really fine steel wool you can get from the hardware store. You just rip off a piece and poke it in the entrance, job done. So that's a really nice, easy way to close the hive as well. Okay, right. we've got time for a couple more questions. Oh, look, just on that cedar too, this will also work on the classic hive, won't it? It will. It, it, there's all sorts of holes and things around here that you can use. I've tried to size it so it fits nicely on all of our hive models. Great. Cedar, do you need to clean the flow frames um, once you've harvested the honey, or do the bees do that? So if you leave your flow frames in the hive, which is a nice way to go, the bees will actually look after them in there. It's only when you start taking the frames off and leaving them around, the vermin gets in, the mold gets in and so on, that you really need to do much cleaning of the flow frame. That said, this trough area here could get a bit gunky sometimes, especially if you haven't looked at it for a while and the bees have blocked up that little leak back point. That one's nice and clean, but you could get into a situation where there's a lot of build up in there putting a, one of those thin dishcloths, uh, wrap it around this key uh, with some, with some uh, nice wet cloth. You can just poke it in there and give that a clean out. So that's the only cleaning maintenance you probably need to do. I rarely ever do that. Uh, it's just it, on the odd occasion where there's a bit of build up in there, you need to clean it out. If you find you've taken your frames off the hive and they're all gone grubby and grungy and you've left honey in them and that's gone fermented and so on, get a hot hose from your laundry, give it a good wash out. It'll be hard to remove all the wax. Uh, then just dry them out and put them back in the hive and leave the rest of the work for the bees to do. Great. So you were talking about that slope before on the um, hive. Does that slope, obviously on the flow hive, it stays all the time. Is that you don't need to adjust anything when you're not harvesting honey? You don't need to, no. So over time your garden will sink and it's good to put these, if you look under here, I've actually put a, a brick. That's to stop the feet sinking into the soft earth of the garden. If you, um, if you do that, then it shouldn't change too quickly, but still just check from time to time that the level is right and the, uh, the hive's on the right slope before you go to harvest. Cedar, can when you get um, honeycomb out of this hive that we're looking at at the moment? You can. So there's a few ways to get honeycomb. One is if you're doing your brood inspection, there's often a lot of honey on the edges. You might choose to cut out some of that comb. You can, if you're using naturally drawn comb, you can just cut a beautiful shape out, drop it straight onto a plate, add your cheese and blueberries and things, and away you go. And I've shown you how to do that in a few, few lives. And, uh, or you can take the whole lot and put it back. The bees will replenish that quite quickly. So that's one way to get comb. Another way is under the roof in this area here, you can take out the plug in the inner cover. So there's a little round hole and that will allow bees up into this roof cavity. Now they will build comb up there once they've filled up this box. And they'll build it like crazy in all sorts of random patterns and that's fun and exciting, but also quite messy. So after a while, you'll wish 
that she didn't let the plug out and let him into the roof cavity. But what you can do is contain that by using perhaps a glass Pyrex baking dish or something like that. Put it over the top and you can watch them build their comb in a confined area, which is something cool to experiment with. Right. Celia, you were talking about cleaning the hives. Would you, what would you think about putting them in your dishwasher? Ah, uh -huh. um, <laughs> I think uh, you might get some grumpy words from your other half as all the wax clogs <laughs> up your dishwasher. Probably not a good idea. <laughs> exactly, and you were mentioning mice, and we've got Jeanette's and tuned in from Coffs Harbour. Is mice a problem here in Australia? Uh, I haven't found any mice problems, no, but it seems to be a common complaint from North America where uh, mice in the winter time, in those long, cold times, and perhaps the south parts of Australia has mice issues, not sure. But what happens is the bee ball moves up through the hive, leaving a kind of vacant, nice, warm area. And if your entrance is big enough, the mice will come right in, make a mess of those brood combs and make a nice, cosy home in the bottom box while your bees are still up the top consuming honey in the upper areas. So that, that's the danger with, with mice. Well, uh, we've, we've got Bronson who's tuned in from Africa actually, and their problem is badgers. Badgers? The badgers take the honey. Oh, tell us about that. I'd love <laughs> to hear about badgers. We have cane toads here, which are an introduced toad that don't take the, the honey, but they take the bees. And that's why we like to get them up off the ground on a bit of a stand like this. The cane toads will sit there, knock on the hive at night, and as the bees come out to investigate, they'll, they'll lick them up. I don't know how they don't get stung in their mouth, but there you go. <laughs> um, badgers eating honey, that's a new one. Uh, yeah, and Tanner's saying, yeah, in Illinois in the US, the mice are such a menace throughout the year. Okay. So watch out for that. Bronson's other question, um, calling in from Africa, just wondering, how, do, they, do the flow hive work with the African bees, or are they just too aggressive? They do work with the African bees. I've got no experience for, uh, about keeping African bees, and I've heard there's, there's really aggressive traits, so careful. Uh, but apparently the flow hive works quite nicely with the African bees. We've also tested it with the Cape honey bee from South Africa. We've also tested it with Apis japonica from Japan with a few modifications of hive size. You can get the flow frames to work with them as well, and that's a, an Asian honey bee. Nice. Here's a good one from Tanner actually. Just wondering, how do the bees know that the honey is gone? Is there, is it the pressure a change or a scent or? So I don't know, but <laughs> somehow underneath the capping, they notice that the honey's drained out from beneath their feet. It must be like uh, walking on a drum skin where it was full of honey and it had a completely different sound to when the honey was gone. That's all I can think because they're so tuned in with what's going on, they can tell when the honey's gone. And if you think about it from a natural perspective, if, if the hive was in a tree, the tree fell over and some of the honey ruptured and, and slowly leaked away, then they might notice behind the capping that the honey's gone and rebuild that area as well. So I can only guess that they were tuned into that from a long time ago. <laughs> See, the Joe's asking, that, um, they've heard that some flowers cause the honey to crystallise, for example, canola. Is this true? It is. So, canola crystallises quite early, or honey will crystallise eventually, and it depends on the, the ratios of sugars in the honey as to how quick temperature affects it as well. So, with canola honey, one of the things you can do with a flow hive is harvest a little bit early. And what that means is you will have warm honey in those frames that you're harvesting from that hasn't gotten cold enough yet to go crystallized. So that's the way if, you've, if you know you're in a canola area or rapeseed it also gets cold, then harvest early as soon as the frames are almost full and that way you won't get that crystallization issue. Typically it happens to commercial beekeepers, they take the box off, it was nice and runny, they take it to the shed, it sits there for a few days and it gets cold overnight, turns candied and they cannot extract it out of the frames. So a little advantage there with the flow hive in terms of being able to harvest early easily. Right. Kathleen's just mentioning cedar, um, they did that heart-shaped honeycomb out of the hive like you did. Did it with gorgonzola and cheese and fruit. Big hit. 
Ah, big hit. <laughs> it is such a hit to, to take a bit of honeycomb from the edge of the hive and put it on a platter. Very nice. Just getting back to that last question, Jamie Oliver recently with his flow hives explained the canola issue and he was harvesting early for that very reason. So you could have a look at that one. Yeah, great. Cedar, do you recommend insulating the roof for winter? So that seems like a good idea if you've got that long, cold snow ahead of you. Now, we don't have that in this area, so there's no need for us here. But putting a bit of insulation in the top, perhaps you could break up some old styrofoam boxes or something like that and put it in the top of your hive. Could be a great idea if you're expecting snowy times ahead. Oh, sorry, Sina. Um, <laughs> how many times do you think that the super will fill up? So, Stone holding the camera has, has been harvesting 20 kilograms per week lately. So you can get on these amazing flows if you've got a strong colony and there's lots of flowers around that you harvest it, they fill it up, you harvest it, they fill it up, you harvest it, they fill it up. And he's had that multiple times, once when he was living down the coast here, another time when he's living out in the hills. So, but then he had a few years where it was a bit slower. So it really depends on the season. And when you get on a good flow like that, it's exciting. You can store a whole lot of honey on the shelf. With a flow hive, it's a bit different to conventional beekeeping. You're storing honey in jars like this instead of storing it in boxes on your hive. So there's a bit less equipment you need to do that. And you can go ahead and keep harvesting when your frames are full. Right, Cedar, now this is, you know, this is now, seed of being, but, but, oh, sorry. But please, <laughs> um, don't, get, don't get too dismayed if you don't even get honey in a whole season. That's what beekeeping's about. Good idea to have more than one hive. The colony could be weak, you may not have had flowers, there could have been a drought, there could have been fires. All these things can affect your honey harvest. You could have a pest or disease issue, so it's just when things align that you get on those amazing honey flows and you can keep harvesting a lot of honey. Right, sorry, so this, this one's a bit of a counselling question. Um, involves the family, Green Meadow Homestead. They, they're in Ontario, Canada on about a third of an acre. Yes. Really wanting to get a hive, but the parents aren't on board because they're really worried that the kids are all gonna get stung. Um, and so just wondering, any tips on getting the family on board because they all love honey? Okay, so if they love honey, that's a really good start, but I'll just speak to the, the dangers of stings. Now, some people have what's called anaphylaxis. Same thing, some kids eat peanuts and they can end up in hospital. Um, so it's a very serious thing. So um, something to keep mindful of, to know your first aid, um, EpiPens and all those sorts of things are, are a good idea but um, I'm no first aid expert, so do your research out there. Um, so that's something to consider. And it's about, most people get localized swelling from stings, I do. And, uh, but the, the dangerous anaphylaxis isn't so common, but something to, to really be aware of as a beekeeper. So if, um, if that's the, I guess, have a look at what we're doing here as well. And to, to, for your first hive, it'd be a good idea to buy some bees off a bee breeder and ask for very gentle ones. It's like chalk and cheese, a gentle hive to an aggressive hive to work with. A gentle hive it sh it shows very little aggression to you and an aggressive hive that they might start chasing you across the yard. So. That's, that's the difference. So start with a nice gentle one, get used to beekeeping and that would be my advice. But it's all, always a, a personal choice um, when deciding to have bees around. It does increase the risk of stings. Of course there's bees around everywhere as well. You can step on the clover and get stung any time. So um, it's unfortunate but bees do have stingers. <laughs> and Fred Dunn, um, who's joined us, has tuned in on this one as well, Cedar, suggesting maybe they go and meet up with some other beekeepers and sort of see how the hives work. Great, good idea. Find someone locally with a flow hive, jump on Facebook, find the, find the groups and maybe go and get a bit of an introduction and, and see what the hive's like and see whether it's for you. Fantastic. Cedar, um, someone's had a bit of a problem with moths and just wondering, the bees seem to be doing all right now. 
Um, is there anything that they need to do? The bees look like they're cleaning up the super, looks like it's going well, but there has been moths in it. Okay, if you've taken the hive, the flow super off, then that's a time when what's called a wax moth can come in and eat the wax. They cannot damage the flow frames. All you need to do is brush off their little webs and stuff before you put it back in and the bees will deal with it. Now, if you've had moths inside the hive while the bees are in there, then you've got a bigger problem because bees won't allow that if they're healthy and the numbers are good. So if that's been happening, then you'll need to do an inspection, check that the, the queen is laying, check you don't have any pests or disease issues that is really slowing down your hive. And once you get happy and healthy, they will keep the moths away from out here. They will get under in the tray area and things outside the hive, but not actually inside the hive unless your hive has a problem. So you just explain just a um, couple of questions coming in. What size hive fits on a conventional eight or ten frame? Okay, so we've confused the beekeeping world because <laughs> flow frames are a little bit wider than standard frames, and that's because when I did lots and lots of measurements of natural comb in hives to decide how wide to build the comb, they like to store honey in deeper cells when they're doing it for honey uh, and they like their brood a little bit less. So for that reason we made flow frames a bit wider. Now there's some maths that had to come into it as well where we needed to make it work across the two common size of Langstroth hives. So this one has seven frames so we call this a flow seven but it fits ten frames in the brood box. So Flow Hive 7 fits a 10 frame Langstroth brood box. The Flow 6, so we've taken one frame away, fits the 8 frame Langstroth brood box. So a bit confusing, but you can work it out. And basically we call it a 6 and 7, Langstroth calls it an 8 or a 10. Just got that, just to confuse you. <laughs> Keep you on your toes. So you know, Sean's asking, really looking forward to um, having a flow hive and been working lots uh, with his grandfather this summer and just wanted to know how easy is it to tell if the flow honey is ready, aka capped? Okay, so that what you've got to do is just get a bit of a gauge. So if you look in the side windows, here's a good example here. You can see that beautiful fresh white capping from beneath the bees' feet there. The bees have decided that that honey is ready and just like a preserving jar they put a wax cap over the top of that honey to say we want it to stay like that and that will preserve the, the moisture content of that honey keep it down around the 18% rate uh, range that the bees are happy with now so once you're seeing capping and you can see here that this frame that we've harvested is uh, is empty this frame here is missing a bit of capping on the edge and this one is mostly full. So you're going after these frames that look mostly full and if you eyeball down between the frames you can actually see the wax capping that the bees have put over the cells as well. So gauging from the end view, looking down in between the frames and the side view you can get a good idea when the honey has the capping over the top and that's when it's ready to harvest. Thank you very much for tuning in and asking so many great questions. It's uh, time to wrap this up now. I'll just run over it once more, how to finish up your harvest. So we've harvested all of these beautiful jars of honey from this one frame. And we've got over, over three kilograms of honey there, which is a nice harvest from a frame. Now put your key right in the top slot. Put it in and turn it. We already did this before, but I'm showing you again. Leave it there for a minute just to put the cell parts back into the cell formed position. If you just give it a quick bounce like that and move on, they might bounce back up and not be aligned and you'll get problems down the track. So once you've done that, you can then turn it back to a 90 and take that out. Then find your little cap. We do include spares with the hive, they are easy to lose. Now, when you put this cap in, it should push all the way to be flush like these other ones. If you've forgotten, it'll sit out like that. If you've forgotten to return the frame, we've put a little reminder tag, which will make it the cap not go in properly. So in it goes. Then you find the little bottom cap here, and it's a case of just the hot swap, trying not to spill honey, and that goes in like that. 
then you can either enjoy those spoils or leave it on the edge of the jar like this for the remaining honey to flow in to the jar. Now, the weight of the honey's up this end, tipping out a little seesaw, but pretty soon that's it there. The honey will drain back into your jar. Make sure you take all exposed honey away from the hive. You don't want to leave exposed honey around for bees to start robbing. As you can see here, when the bees are going about their business, they generally don't come for the honey. But sometimes when they're really hungry or you've got a robbing mentality happen because somebody's left some honey around, then they can really go for the honey. And it's a case of just closing these covers like this and like this. And that's it, your harvest is complete. Thank you very much for tuning in again. Let us know what you'd like us to cover next week and we'll have something interesting to show you, same time. Beautiful.